Good morning. Whoa, that's loud. Good to have you. Good to have you all here. This is the day the Lord has made. We are glad if you're on Zoom, if you're on Facebook, we're so glad that you tuned in. Uh, a couple of disclaimer slides uh, when they bring down the pre-service and put up the... Uh, uh, we have two disclaimers. One is uh, whatever follows uh, our Facebook uh, service is not endorsed by us. And the second is just to remember that if you lose your Zoom or uh, Facebook feed, it's on uh, YouTube. You can go to our website and pick up the whole, pick up the whole service. I um, also have a pre-service slide there that simply says, if you are a guest, please fill out a, uh, a guest card that are in front of you and put it in the offering plates or give it to me. If you're on Facebook or Zoom, go to, uh, go to our website and hit, con and, and hit the contact button, and then that'll allow us to, 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 know, uh, to know who you are. Um, we're still trying to uh, staff, a, uh, staff a nursery for uh, Sunday school. So if you're, if you're open to that, you can talk to Sarah. Um, you're going to hear about a mission lunch today in just a minute. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're getting a good number of items for the Gusky Shelter. That's a shelter that's uh, over on St. Mary's for uh, students that are kind of in the, um, they're in the legal system, working through uh, some issues. And um, our own uh, Kelsey uh, Klein is active there, and she's the one who's uh, helping us to do that. Men's Ministry is back. Uh, we'll meet the, the last second Thursday for lunch and the last uh, Wednesday night. 7.15 for a discussion group. Tonight at 6 is our first uh, chess group. If you, are, if you don't even know what you're doing, like me, um, join us tonight at 6. And Tim Samolaitis, who is a, um, a tournament-level uh, chess player, is going to guide some of us through the basics. It'll also be on Zoom if you'd like to Zoom in and, uh, and see what we're doing. Women's Bible study uh, tomorrow at noon. Judy Prater facilitates. Uh, next two Sundays, 23rd and 30th. On the 23rd, we're going to look at groups that have marked Emmanuel. We're going to look at our history. And so if you know about the Excelsior class, the Crusader class, or the Harvester class, I want to talk about these uh, crucial groups that have made such a mark on our fellowship. And that's going to be part of the service. So um, I've already talked to Jan, and Jan has gone through the uh, annual reports and given me a write-up on the Crusaders, but I need uh, some background on Excelsiors, I need background on Harvesters, so that I can adequately talk about some of the significant aspects of those groups. And then on May 30th is uh, Memorial Day weekend, we're going to look at the people that have marked us, and we have a list of people over the last two years that have passed away, but there may be others at Emmanuel that have marked you in a significant way. We want to talk about the lives of the people that have made Emmanuel great uh, and on that weekend where we remember those that served our country as well as people that have been in our lives. Uh, COVID safety rules, uh, that you, uh, you, most of you know CDC and the state of West Virginia says you don't need to wear masks in groups. Um, early service, 60% of the people at our early service, small, were wearing masks. So it just tells me that there are still a number of people who are not going to be in public without masks for a while. And I just ask that we all be sensitive that uh, even, though the, uh, even though the guidelines and the mandate's been removed, we still need to be uh, sensitive toward people who don't feel, uh, don't feel fully safe yet. Uh, scholarship applications need to be in, and I'll turn it over to uh, Eileen to tell you about what's happening at noon. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all here. Um, I wanted to make a request and extend an invitation. So um, this will, today, we are going to have our first mission lunch um, since the COVID pandemic uh, has kind of put the kibitz on them. And so I'm hoping that you all can join. Even if you can't sit with us, maybe you could take a meal to go. Um, we decided as a mission team to sponsor our first lunch with, for the Dominican Republic. And there was a variety of reasons for that. Um, primarily, they were the lowest funded of all of our international missionaries. And um, Dominican, the mission there is run by Madeline Flores. And they have been particularly hard hit, uh, not only because of the poverty um, that is just in the Dominican Republic, but also her mission serves uh, the, at the border with Haiti. 
And so every summer they do great mission work that serves not only the DR, but the people that stay in the Betais and on the border um, with Haiti. And mission teams come week after week and they bring resources and help and encouragement. And last summer there was none of that. So um, for those two reasons, we would like to see Madeline is not fully funded and she cannot return to the DR even if the pandemic is, um, restrictions are lifted until she is fully funded. So if God tugs at your heart to make a donation and or come grab a lunch to go or stay with us and eat lunch, we have a taco bar that's um, nutritious and delicious. We'd love to share it with you. Um, Okay, and we also recently, the last team that went to the Dominican Republic was actually a youth team uh, from Emmanuel Baptist. And so uh, I, I finagled one of the members who happened to be my daughter uh, to give a little ex um, expression of what her experience was there. So she's going to share that with you. So I pray for your um, generosity. Thank you. The, the video is in two parts. Just go from part one directly to part two. It'll, yeah, you'll get it. Go now. I had the opportunity to go down to the Dominican Republic with a team of others from EBC to meet up with a missionary there that we support as a church named Marlene Flores. And um, we just had a challenging but a wonderful week getting to witness and participate in all of the different programs um, that Madeline has her hands in, so to speak, in the community and surrounding areas of San Cristobal, uh, Dominican Republic, where she lives and serves. And some of the critical issues affecting the Dominican as a country, uh, historically and, and still now, are poverty, um, high rates of domestic abuse, and um, the presence of sort of like these isolated, segregated communities. So while we were down there, um, Madeline had us visiting, doing some community outreach to these isolated communities like the orphanages and then the sugarcane camps where workers and their families live in really poor conditions, sometimes their whole lives on the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And we were doing VBS with the kids there. We were bringing um, supplies to the families like toiletries and textbooks and other school Bibles, other school materials. And then we also got to help out around the retreat center where Madeline hosts different mission teams, just doing some renovation and maintenance work to the actual facility. So I think that Emmanuel as a church should continue to support the work of Madeline Flores in the Dominican Republic. There's a high level of need. And I know that we as a missions team 10 years ago now had a wonderful week just um, growing closer to each other and to God through service. So thank you. A lot of you that maybe haven't finalized your lunch plans will consider staying. Whenever uh, Eileen does any kind of a, a food-related event, it is always amazingly good, and I think you'll be glad. You'll be glad that you stayed. Let us uh, prepare our hearts as uh, David plays the prelude.
As we uh, continue to worship, uh, John chose a, a passage in 1 Corinthians 15 that made me think of uh, the resurrection. Um, and so I, I found a, a praise song that we have done before called Glorious Day. And I love how the, in, the, in, in three short verses it summarizes the entire gospel. So as you, uh, as you pick it up, sing along with us. shined among us his glory Continue to worship together as we rise and sing, uh, He Lives. God. 
God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He today as we gather it's good uh, as each week we see more uh, people coming coming back and worshiping in person we're also grateful father for those that will continue to follow us on zoom or on facebook together we are lifting our voices in praise to you we're focused on you and your glory father we look around us and we watch the news and we can feel uh, despair but when we look at you and we realize that you're on your throne and no matter what happens on this planet, you're in control. And if we read the book of Revelation, we know that you win. We know that all things are being brought together to that glorious end, to the wedding supper of the Lamb, and we will gather around uh, that throne. You'll wipe every tear from our eyes, and we will bask in light and love and glory for the rest of eternity. We're grateful, Father, that we can do now on earth what we will do forever 
uh, in heaven. And so, Father, bless this time. Bless Jonathan as he shares with us and our prayers and our praises. We pray they bring glory and honor to you. And now we pray together as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would, look around you. Say hello to those that are near. Are you green? Yeah. I'm green. No. Wait. Yes. Are we on? Wait. Good? Yep, we're on. Ooh, that blows. <laughs> oh, I guess. Hi. Hi. Hey, we're we're together. That's. It's probably not a good idea, but um, <laughs> so Keith, we're gonna we're gonna talk about something really serious today. So oh. we're just gonna jump right into the. There's, okay, I'll let you go ahead. Okay, there's no. We're not gonna. We're, it, there's too much of a lesson. We don't have time to to really do anything fun. Um, so uh, it's important. So we're just gonna jump right into the verse. And you know, the Bible says that um, beloved, let us love one another. Sorry. Sorry, how about that? I got bored. My bad. Okay. Okay, so the Bible tells us, beloved, let us love one another. Because love is of God, and everybody that loves loves God because God is God is love. <laughs> will you will you take that off? Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're, tr sorry. we're trying to teach a lesson sorry. here. Sorry, okay? Sorry. Sorry, I got bored. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So anyway, the Bible says, the Bible says, beloved, let us love one another. Okay? Because it's important that, because God loves us, and when we love each other, then we... Sorry. 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 You're, you're not being very respectful here. Yeah, you know what? You're right. I'm not, and I apologize. You're right. I should be more respectful, because when I'm disrespectful, they're, they're not listening to you. They're watching me. I apologize. I'm sorry. That's okay. Because one of the ways that we show love each other, <laughs> one of the ways we show love to each other is that when we are talking, especially when a teacher is talking or a leader and they're talking, one of the ways we show love to them is that we listen and we pay attention and we don't play with turkeys and distract. The, I missed everything he said because I wasn't paying attention. So again, I do apologize. That's okay. I forgive you. Thank you. And that's another way that we can show each other love is to forgive each other when we have a rock. That's, that's very interesting. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> Thank you, God, for the fact that you, you do love us, even when we don't pay attention, even when we don't um, act the way that we should sometimes, even when we are not respectful of each other. Lord, help us to always uh, keep that in mind and help us to forgive each other uh, when, when we do things that we shouldn't. And Lord, we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. If your child was not up front, but they would like to be in a children's church, they need to uh, rise up and, and head out. As we um, come to our time of offering, a gift that we would like to give to you is our daily bread is in for June, July, and August. So um, pick that up. Or if you're watching on Facebook uh, or Zoom and you want us to send this to you, just call, call the... Uh, Call the church and we'll mail it to you. Uh, for those of you that, that are watching, thank you for sending your 
your uh, contributions and donations into the church office, or you can you can go on to our website and you can give you can give on online. Uh, again, just to remind you, if you're watching online and you go to the website, you can hit contact and in the upper right hand of the header and let us know who you are. And if you have a prayer concern or a need, let us know. Um, every week we get thank you notes from the people that our, our gifts go out to. So this week we got a nice note from House to Home because of all the items that were collected and they were really appreciative. We got a note from Old Man Rivers because they get a check from us every month. We got a note from Salvation Army because they get a check from us every month. And uh, we also got a note from Young Life um, uh, Youth Ministry um, because we support them as well. So thank you. Thank you for your, for your generosity. Um, we are blessed uh, all through this uh, time of change with the pandemic and all. Uh, Pam has been wonderful to bring some of her friends and uh, students uh, and and others to sing for us. And so now we're going to be blessed by Lindsay Lankala, a uh, music education major at WVU. And she's going to sing a song for us called The uh, Desire of My Heart.
thank you for a hauntingly beautiful song that has uh, reminded me that I simply need to call out to you and you hear my voice and you know my heart and you will answer uh, my prayer. Father, help us to be the answer to someone else's prayer as they are in need and we, uh, by the Spirit, are aware. Um, we will find ways to respond and help and serve. Thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, some uh, some praises. Uh, one that I was this week. I went up to see uh, Joe Hayes up at uh, Eagle Point, now Stone Rise, and uh, Joe has taken an interest in our church sign and all the beautiful rose bushes. But he's up at uh, he's up at Eagle Point and not able to uh, to be there. So he empowered the freezes, Evan and Margaret, to plant two new roses. Which, if you look, they're really small right in the front. And keep the picture there because you need to notice that all the mulch around the sign is, uh, is brand new, along with the mulch all around the facility, which uh, a number of people came and, uh, uh, at Lyndall Jones's request. And um, just, if you just look around our church lawn, you can't help but feel, uh, feel good that uh, someone like Lyndall worked so hard to get a lawn crew together, and they just keep our, uh, they keep our church looking wonderful. So... Uh, we're grateful, and Joe Hayes feels wonderful that he's able to continue to tend our roses through the freezes. They go up there, and he tells them what to do and what to prune and how to do it. So he is taking care of, taking care of the roses from a, from a distance, and that's good. Um, Adam, I'm wondering, uh, I put two pictures right below the graduate. Um, if you look down, there's going to be, yeah, keep going. Uh, I, I need to put those in here. Uh, yeah, there's two standalone pictures after the, after the graduate that John's going to come and do. Keep, if you go down about two in there, you'll, you'll find them. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, just, the, just a picture. That's uh, Jalen, I think. Yeah, we didn't get everybody's graduation, but Judy, Judy sends us everything. I mean, we get pictures of, we get pictures of her grandkids, like 100 every week, and we're like, no, Judy, I'm sorry. We can't put them all in, but we thought to put that in. And then the one right below that, that's uh, Bra uh, Braden Jefferson who asked uh, Faith to, his girlfriend Faith to marry him last week, and she said yes. And uh, uh, Braden just graduated, and you'll hear, you'll hear more. So you can go, uh, go back up to the one that says uh, prayer concerns and praises, or praises and prayer concerns, and leave it there. Uh, the church, uh, church voted to, uh, to, bring a, to buy a church bus thanks to... Um, John Nicholson and, and his, he had a good uh, team working with him, but we finally finalized it, and 8 a.m. Monday morning, it'll be here. Uh, this bus is a nice, nice addition to our church ministry, and already we're planning some trips with Tuesday Fellowship to, uh, to go around and, uh, and do some things together on it. Uh, we will be having just a simple, uh, we need some folks that are willing to drive it. We have some regulars, but if you're interested in that ministry, we're going to have an opportunity to drive it around the parking lot and just to give you a feel, a feel for it. You'll be on the parking lot before we let you get out on the, ro on the road. Um, thankful to Car uh, Carol Freifogel for her ministry with Tuesday Fellowship. She has others that work with her, but they met for the last time um, um, before September will be the next, next meeting, but she always does a wonderful job. Last week, uh, Meridor Keck and Betsy Jefferson were, were back with us in, in worship, and we're grateful for that. Um, Kendall Kane, a friend of Mary Molson's battling pancreatic cancer and also the grieving the loss of his brother. Uh, Dave, a friend of uh, Robbie Leonard uh, struggling with addiction, has uh, made a commitment to follow Christ, and he and his girlfriend are both trying to get into a rehab program, so let's keep Dave in our prayers. Patty Golden, a friend of Jane Graham's dealing with the death of her husband, Butch, um, and providing support for her daughter. Mike Hayden is on the, the back row, and when he came through the door, I was like, Mike, what are you doing here? Uh, and he, he said, well, I've come to worship the Lord. I said, that's a good thing. Um, it's, always good to have, it's always good to have Mike with us. It's been a challenging, it's been a challenging year, uh, and we want to keep, uh, keep Mike and Cheryl uh, in our prayers. Uh, Gary Davenport's uh, mom had a heart attack, and that's all we know right now, but he's asking for prayer. Uh, Dee Lalamont continues to serve on the border with unaccompanied children. And uh, she said, I am in my element, but I am, <laughs> her last note said, I'm tired too. They work long, uh, they work long hours. 
Uh, Barb Malcolm is here, and she's uh, working with uh, Cleveland Clinic to finalize uh, some heart valve, heart valve procedure. Edith McDonald needs to be in our prayers. Uh, Butch Powell, friend of um, Mike and Cheryl Hayden, has been diagnosed with, with pancreatic cancer. Pat Sayer has a date now. She'll have uh, heart valve surgery on May 25th. And uh, Doug Smith is listed in our prayer concerns, but he passed away this week. That's the uh, brother, of, uh, brother of Larry, Larry Smith. Um, those are all the prayer concerns, and I'm going to let John now um, honor our graduates. Well, good morning. Every year we, we have this time where we get to honor and recognize our high school and our college graduates. This year is especially uh, sweet because um, all of our graduates last year were not able to, to celebrate in, in the presence of, of others. So we're not only rejoicing in their accomplishment, we're, we're rejoicing that now they're, they're able to celebrate with friends and family. Um, so um, we have a list in your bulletin, and we'll go through these. And if you are here and you are a graduate, as I read your name, we invite you to stand and remain standing. And then when we get through the whole list, then uh, we would like to celebrate with you and recognize your accomplishments. So for our high school graduates this year, we have Jacob Britton, who has graduated from Williamstown High School, and he plans on attending Concord University in Athens, West Virginia. Abigail Davis, uh, graduating from Parkersburg High School. She plans on attending WVUP and then eventually transferring to WVU to pursue a degree in marine biology and environmental science. Annabelle Jefferson is the granddaughter of Betsy Jefferson, and she graduated from Pennsylvania Leadership Charter School. Her plans are currently undecided. Tatum Jones, granddaughter of Lyndall and Judy Jones, graduated from Parkersburg South High School. She plans on going to Marshall University and majoring in pre-veterinary uh, courses. Becca Saucy uh, graduated from Parkersburg High School. She also plans on attending WVUP and pursuing a degree in early childhood education. Nicholas Van Way, who is the grandson of Jean Van Way, uh, graduated from Parkersburg South High School, and right now his plans are currently undecided. So for our high school graduates, can we express our appreciation to them? Before I move into our college graduates, you guys can sit down now. Um, uh, this Wednesday, we are honoring our high school graduates with our annual graduate dinner. So uh, the high school graduates got to choose the menu, and Jewel's always really good about honoring their wishes. Uh, so if you show up this Wednesday for dinner, uh, we'll have a special meal, and, um, and we'll recognize them again. And their parents will have the opportunity to speak a blessing over them. And we as a church will have the opportunity to commission them in prayer. So come this Wednesday for dinner. Uh, for our college graduates, uh, we have Rachel Filizoff, who graduated from John Carroll University uh, with a degree in arts and communication. Brendan Jefferson, who we just saw in the picture. It's a double congratulations for him because he graduated and now he's engaged. Graduated from Marshall University with a degree in occupational safety and health. Kim Matheny graduated from WVUP with an Associates of Arts degree. David Mayer graduated from the WVU School of Business with a degree in economics. Jalen Prater, grandson of Judy Prater, graduated from Birmingham Southern College with a degree in urban environmental studies. Jack Rates graduated from Glenville State College with an associate's degree in land surveying. And Kimberly Samulitis, who is the daughter of Tim and Gail Samulitis, graduated from Ohio University with a BSN degree in nursing and is currently an ICU nurse at Camden Clark. So can we honor our college graduates as well? <laughs> Kurt's gonna lead us in a song now as we head into a time of prayer. And when we come to this time of prayer, I'm gonna ask that you recognize that, that graduation is, is a time of celebration and a time of increased prayer. Uh, so we are both praising the Lord for how he's brought them so far and then and trusting them to his care in prayer. So as we go to a time of prayer, I would ask you to, to, um, to lift two or three of these names or all of these names up in your quiet prayers to the Lord. Join us as we uh, sing together the Gaither uh, chorus, Something Beautiful.
Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful of my life. Grateful for what you have done in the lives of these students and what you are going to continue to do. Father, thank you for the gift of parenthood. Lord, thank you that you offer us a glimpse of what it is to be to be a parent, uh, as you are to us. Um, Father, we are grateful for the joys and the tears as well. And now we entrust these, uh, these students into your care. Lord, we ask that you would direct their thoughts, you would guard their hearts, you would um, lead them down the paths that you have set for them, Father. And every step of the way, you would draw fruit from the seeds of your word that have been planted in their hearts and planted in their thoughts. Father, I pray they would bear fruit for your kingdom, fruit for uh, fruit for their loved ones and fruit for your glory. Lord, we offer you all these things. And now, Lord, we pray that you would be with us as we look into your word, that uh, you would teach us, that we would be um, led by your Holy Spirit, taught by your Holy Spirit, and once again, give you all the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Well, once again, I've, I've placed our responsive reading right before our sermon. I like how that kind of prepares our thoughts, maybe, hopefully, I don't know. Um, but uh, for today's responsive reading, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 8. Our sermon theme is going to be continuing the idea of how the church marches on in and toward victory. And so this, uh, this passage from, from Isaiah is a song of victory, and so I'm going to ask you to, to treat it that way. So please stand with me as we read from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 8. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the finest of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the child and the bulls of all peoples, the sheep and the daughters of all nations. He will bring the poor and the He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. You may be seated. Just to give you an idea of the kind of in-depth, profound conversations we have in my household, um, earlier this week, we got into a brief discussion on if, if there's no death in heaven, then how do we get to eat meat? <laughs> um, like if there are chickens in heaven, which is a big if, I suppose, and the chickens can't die, where am I going to get my chicken wings? <laughs> and so you have all bore witness to the truth of the gospel as we've read. God promises there will be a banquet with the best of meats. Okay, we said it, we saw it, it's true. All right, so when we get there, that's what I'm expecting. But um, praise the Lord. All right, uh, I'm, I made a, made a commitment to the, to, to the people in the, in, in the early service. I said, you know, my... My, my goals today are twofold. I want to preach the word. I want to bring out the truth that God has for us in, in Scripture, number one. And number two is um, uh, I, I want to get you out in time. Uh, it seems like the last few times I've, I've preached, I've gone over a little bit. Um, the bad news for you guys is I failed in that second one in the first service, okay? Um, the good news for you guys is we have more time in second service anyway, so you probably won't notice. Um, so we're just going to jump right in, okay? Um, and, and if you remember two weeks ago, um, we had uh, the sermon, The Church Marches On, Part 1, okay? And so today is going to be continuing that thought. And so a couple weeks ago, we were looking at this wonderful passage in Second Chronicles 20, right? Where, where God's people are faced with this, with this crisis, that they're faced with this, with this insurmountable opposition where these three armies are gathered in alliance against them. Right? And so they're, they desperately seek God, and God's instruction to them, God's, God's battle plan to them in that crisis is to march forward to meet the enemy. He says, I want you to, 
to, to march to where the enemy is encamped, go face first into this meat grinder of these three armies allied against you, okay? And as you march in obedience, I will bring about the victory, and you don't even have to lift your swords. There's nothing you have to do but to go and watch the victory happen, right? And we know that that's how it played out. And that as the Israelites march forward in obedience, and as they march forward toward victory, that they marched forward in worship, right? And so um, many times in our battles, many times in our, in our conflicts, the victory begins when we are able to worship God regardless of the circumstance, the victory begins when we're able to worship God before we even see the victory. And so we hear, um, we read and we hear stories like that from the Old Testament, these wonderful stories, and we, we gain inspiration from them, we gain motivation from them. But then when it comes time to, to think about and to figure out how do we apply those truths in a new covenant context, Right? How do we take the ideas of victory in the Old Testament and we say, well, we are now new covenant believers. There's, there's, there's a new covenant that God has given us. What does victory look like? Sometimes it's difficult for us to take those ideas and, and figure out day-to-day, real-life application, what does it look like? What does it look like to march forward in victory when we're not on a physical battlefield? What does victory itself even look like, you know, um, the Old Testament believers didn't have it easy. We're not trying to say that they had it easy. But we look back at their experiences, and sometimes, if you're like me, sometimes I think to myself, it, it'd be nice to, to, have a, to, to know who our enemy is, right? It'd be nice to have a physical, tangible target. It'd be nice to, to, to have a physical battlefield so, so that at least I can see what's happening. At least I can have some semblance of control, even though it's not real control. Um, But as we consider these things as new covenant believers, we know that God has not called us any longer to physical warfare, right? God's not, part part of God's covenant for us is not to, to, to have victory over people physically. Um, So what does it mean tangibly to march on toward the battlefield, defiantly charging um, an overpowering enemy camp, and to find victory already accomplished when we arrive. Uh, part of the reason why we struggle with this, I think, is um, because sometimes we, we're looking for victory over the wrong enemies. Sometimes we begin looking for victory over the wrong enemies, and when we do that, we wind up finding ourselves fi- fighting battles we were never intended to fight, right? Um, Sometimes, um, sometimes we have a hard time with this. Sometimes we struggle because we lack the skill or the fluency with the tools that God has given us to bring about victory. In the Old Testament, it was kind of, it's kind of straightforward. You learn how to use a sword. You learn how to use a spear or a shield, and that's how you train. Okay? But the tools that God has given us for today, for our spiritual battles today, are different. And sometimes we struggle to know what victory looks like because we don't know how to use the tools that God has given us to bring about victory. And perhaps the greatest challenge, perhaps the hardest thing of this is, as I said before, sometimes we don't even know what victory looks like. Sometimes we, we struggle to know, when is it, Lord, that I can, I can relax? When is it that I can stop fighting? And we have this idea of victory that is in the far future, in the distant future. We kind of we, we kind of get it, like, like, like we know that, that one day we're going to be in God's presence, one day we're going to be with him, and there will be a very tangible victory there that we can see. And so, and so we sometimes think, well, victory is for that day. And so a lot of us are just waiting to die. A lot of us are just waiting to be in the presence of God before we can really experience victory. Is that what God has for us? Or is there a very real, tangible victory that we can live out today? in the here and now, and what does that look like? So we don't know who the enemy is, we don't know how to fight the enemy, and we don't know when to stop fighting a lot of times. And so the idea of victory for a new covenant believer can be difficult. So that's why we're diving back into this topic again today um, from a new covenant perspective, because as Jesus followers, we are no longer called 
to pick up sword and shield to defend the faith. Um, we're called to pick up and carry the cross of Jesus, right? We're called to pick up and to carry with us the word of truth to lead us forward into victory and into worship as the Israelites did before us. So for our scripture today, our primary scripture, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, don't, don't go there yet, sound booth. I'm going to keep the sound booth on your toes today because we have a lot of scripture to get through. So you guys get ready. Um, but, uh, but our primary scripture is going to be 1 Corinthians 15. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We're going to start there and we're going to end there. And we're going to be going to a lot of places in between. Um, so let's go ahead and go. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50, 54 through 58. What does victory look like? When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our, our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So this passage is going to form the basis of, of, of how we're going to look at the ways we march on, the ways the church marches on in victory today. All right, and so first, the first thing I want us to look at is uh, this passage lets us know who our enemies are. All right, remember I said the first, one, one, one of the reasons why we struggle is because we struggle to know who the enemy actually is. And before I look at who our enemies are, I think it's important that we remind, that we are reminded of who our enemies are not. Because a lot of times we, we, we focus so much of our energy, so much of our frustration, so much of what we would call righteous wrath, although in God's eyes it's probably misplaced zeal, we focus so much of that towards the wrong enemy because, um, because again, we don't know who it's supposed to be. But I want to remind us that other people, other human beings, are not the enemy. Okay? And a lot of times it's easy for us to pick on physical, tangible, visible people, and we say they're the enemy because just like the Old Testament believers, we want a tangible target. We want a tangible focus for our anger. And so we begin to take it out on other people made in the image of God. The scripture says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Remember the words of Ephesians 6.12. We have that passage up there where Paul says, um, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. People, other people, are not our enemy. People are not the enemy of God's kingdom. So our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. So those words, rulers, authorities, powers, that refers to spiritual warfare, to demonic forces that, are, that have positions of influence in our world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay, so, so before we, we figure out who it is that we are called to march against, let's remember who we're, who, 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 who we're not called to march against, and that is other people. Um, and just in case you still struggle with, a, with this idea, just in case you, you, you think, well, well, there are definitely people out there who, who are enemies of the gospel. There are definitely people out there who are antagonistic. They have to be our enemies. How can they not be our enemies? Okay, fine. Let's look at what Jesus said about our enemies. If we have to have people as our enemies, which I don't think we do, but if we do, what does Jesus say? How does Jesus say we should think and pray about our enemies? Let's go to um, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 44. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So first of all, Scripture says, our conflict is not against flesh and blood. People are not the enemy. If you're determined to have a flesh and blood enemy, fine. Then pray for them. Then your call is not to fight against them, 
not to come against them, but to pray for them. And just in case, again, because our flesh is the way our flesh is, maybe we're thinking, okay, fine, I'll pray for them, but I'm going I'm to be praying some prayers of David over them. I'm going to be praying prayers like, Lord, cast down my enemy, strike down my enemy, let them fall into a pit in the middle of a rainy day. I'm going to pray that over my enemy, okay? Um, that, those aren't the prayers that God's called us to. In fact, Jesus modeled for us, right, how to pray for our enemies when he was on the cross. In the book of Luke, chapter 23, verse 34, what does he say? Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. So Jesus' heart for the people that we might consider his enemies, his prayer for them is one of forgiveness. We like the prayers of David because they're very self-justifying, they're very self-righteous, and those prayers maybe make sense under an old covenant model because that was part of God's covenant with the Israelites to destroy their enemies, okay? We're not old covenant believers. We have to get that through our heads. Those things are there for a reason. They're good for us to reflect on and to learn from, but we are new covenant believers, and in the new covenant, Jesus says, pray for your enemies love them. And that's so difficult for so many of us because, you know, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to delegitimize some of our hurts and our pains. We have people in our lives who have caused hurt and pain and abuses to us. And the very idea, the very thought of praying for them, praying for God's blessing over them is repulsive to us. And it's enough to drive us back into the depths of that trauma. And so I don't want to I don't want to minimize that experience for those of us who have had that experience. And the only image I can conjure up that would give us um, a, a beacon of inspiration in that is, again, the image of Jesus on the cross, who had suffered the most, most unimaginable abuses at the hands of other people, who was beaten to beyond recognizability, and still his prayer for them, his words for them, are, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. People are not the enemy. People are oftentimes deceived by the enemy, and sometimes they can be used by the enemy, but they are not the enemy. Um, we are all lost sheep without a shepherd, searching desperately for hope, and Jesus has given us that hope. And so our role with other people is to be the rescuers, or to rescue them, not treat them as enemies. Every human being on the planet has been made in the image of God and is included in the words of John 3.16 that we all know so well, for God so loved the world, everyone in it. All right? So that's important for us to lay out before we get into who the enemy actually is. Let's remember who it's not. We are not called into warfare against others made in God's image. Instead, who does Scripture say the enemy actually is? Well, our passage lists three enemies to the kingdom of God, and I will add a fourth one afterward, okay? So first of all, it says at the end of verse 54, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? And so death is the enemy. Death is a corruption of God's perfect creation. Death was never intended as part of what God created. It's an intruder. It is an unwelcome presence in the beautiful creation of God. Why? Because death causes separation. Death separates us physically from our loved ones, and it separates us spiritually from our Creator, from our Lord. And because of that, death is, has become the thief of hope. So many people struggling with hopelessness because of the presence of death in our world. It is the antithesis of everything that God desires for his people because remember, Jesus, Jesus does, doesn't say, I give you life. He doesn't say, I want to show you life. Jesus says, I am life. Remember that from John 14? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so if Jesus is the living embodiment of life, the incarnate life, and he invites us into himself to take part in that life, then death is the very opposite of what Jesus desires for his people. So death is the enemy. And then next, it says the sting of death is sin. And so sin is the enemy. Sin is what causes death and separation between us and God to begin with. And sin makes a mockery of us. It makes a mockery of every effort that we come up with, every, every ounce of willpower that we drive at trying to become better people, 
Sin looks at our efforts, makes a mockery of them, and constantly reminds us that no matter how hard we try, no matter how far we've come, we can simply never do enough to outweigh our mistakes. Sin is ever at our doorstep, ever knocking on, on the doors of our thoughts and on the doors of our heart and reminding us of who we are, or at least who we once were. And then it says, and the power of, the, of sin is the law. So this is kind of a funny one. All right, so death is an enemy. We can understand that. Sin certainly is an enemy. We understand that. But now it says the law. that The law is also an enemy. And it's important to understand it's not saying the law is evil. Paul writes in, in, in the book of Romans that the law has a purpose. The law is, is, is actually holy, that God has designed it for a reason. And Jesus says, I didn't come to get rid of the law. I came to fulfill it. So the law isn't evil. The law is not our ally because the law brings nothing but judgment. It, it, it does nothing but confirm um, that we are deserving of judgment. The law deceives us into believing that somehow in our own efforts we can bridge that gap of separation between us and God, and yet the law itself is incapable of bridging that gap. And so it leaves us with nothing but failure. It dares us to try to reach God on our own strength, but constantly reminds us that we are unable and that we are too weak. It is unswerving, unmoving, and unforgiving in its declaration of condemnation over anyone who tries to live up to its standard. Law might not be evil, but it is not our ally. So death, sin, law, these are the enemies of the kingdom of God. And the fourth one that we add um, from 1 Peter 5, 8, how do we have that? Uh, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And so these first three, death, sin, law, these are the tools of the enemy. These are the tools that Satan lobbies at us constantly, bombarding us with these attacks and with these traps. Um, the Bible says that he is a father of lies. He is the great deceiver. He's, he's been a, a liar and a murderer from the beginning. He's the accuser of the saints. He is the great adversary, the one who stands in the way. If you think about everything you've learned or read or heard about Satan from the scriptural account, um, you know that he, 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 he's an expert in deception. He obscures the truth. In the garden, he deceives Eve by, by mixing just enough deception which is a, which, with just a little bit of truth to draw her away from, from what God has told him. Um, in the book of Job, he lobbies accusations against Job and again mixes in just enough truth. He says, Job only follows you, God, because you bless him. Well, the truth was God had blessed Job, right? Um, but he uses that. He turns God's blessings into accusations and he accuses the saints. And you remember his temptation of Jesus in the wilderness and how he uses even scripture to tempt and to lie. And so Satan is a liar. He uses enough truth in his lies to deceive us. These four forces are the enemies of the kingdom of God. And therefore, they are the enemies of every kingdom citizen. And as we as we think about them, this is very different from just having someone across the battlefield that we can see, that we can pick up a sword and like go stab them. That'd be so much easier sometimes, right? Because I, I, I can tangibly see that person and have some control there. But we can't take up arms against these enemies. We have no way to physically overpower or even engage in combat with these enemies. And the beauty of what we're talking about here is that we don't have to. Is that God has already done it for us. In our story from two weeks ago, the Israelites marched in victory, and God told them, you won't have to lift your sword. And so we also don't even have to begin to lift our swords against these enemies. The battle over them has already been fought while we are still on our way to victory. It is fought and won in the, present, I'm sorry, in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, look at verse 57 of our main text. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus, we have all the victory we could ever need. Jesus has already overthrown each and every one of these. By his sinless life, by the way he lived perfectly, he's overcome the law. 
right? He tells his disciples, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. And so he lives perfectly, and through his perfect, sinless life, he defeats and satisfies the righteous demands of the law. Through his death on the cross, he takes our sin. Scripture says that he takes our sin. He carries our sin onto his own person and carries our sins to the cross, and they are put to death with him on the cross. And so through his death, he defeats our sins, right? And then three days later, he comes back from the dead, and he defeats death itself. And Scripture says that when we allow ourselves to die with him on the cross, that we will certainly be raised with him in resurrection. And so he grants us his, the same resurrection that he's experienced. And by granting us resurrection, he grants us victory. And then over and over and over again in Scripture, he uses the truth of God's word to cut, overcome the lies and the temptations of Satan. By speaking truth, Jesus defeated Satan's temptations by speaking truth, he disarmed the angry mob ready to stone an adulterous woman. By speaking truth in love, he overcame strongholds of demonic power, broke through to prideful hearts, and brought healing to the deepest of wounds using the testimony of truth. If Satan is a father of lies, if he is a father of deception, then you can be sure that his, his nemesis is the word of truth. And Jesus says, what about himself? That he is truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, it is truth that sets us free. Scripture says you will know truth, and the truth will set you free. It is truth that sets us free from the chains of guilt. Truth sets us free from the chains of anxiety and from the chains of fear. Each of those things, just like our enemy, mixes enough truth in with deception, in with the lie, to ensnare us. But just like Jesus did with Satan, when we rest on the truth of God's word, then we are set free. So what does victory look like? We know who our enemy is. We understand that God's given us um, the person of Jesus and the truth of his word as the tools of our victory. When do we get to rest? When do we get to stop fighting? Um, living resurrected lives in the here and now, according to this passage, is what victory looks like. Look at verse 54 again. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and when the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. So ultimate victory only comes when the mortal puts on immortality. Um, and so when we who are mortal, when we who are perishable put on Jesus, the imperishable, the, Im the immortal, that is when we experience victory. Let's look at Romans 13, 14. Can we pull that up? Romans 13, 14. Uh, rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And then right after that, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Can we pull that one up as well, please? Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And so victory happens when we, when we lay aside the corrupt nature of our flesh and we instead clothe ourselves with the person of Jesus, when we find ourselves in Jesus, and so victory looks like Jesus. Victory looks like when your life starts to look more and more like the life of Jesus Christ. So we don't have to wait for eternity one day. We don't have to wait to pass from this life into the next life. We begin to experience victory in the here and now the more and more we look like Jesus, the more and more we clothe ourselves with Jesus. Okay, so victory happens when we refuse to believe that we are defined by our basest of instincts, and we refuse to lower ourselves to the standards and practices of the world around us. And we instead choose to respond to the holy calling of Christ-likeness. 
And it's in that calling of Christ-likeness that we begin to find our hope. We begin to find our peace, our purpose, our motivation, and our identity completely in Jesus. Jesus experienced a lot of things in his physical life on earth. Jesus experienced pain. Jesus experienced hurt. Uh, He experienced sorrow. He experienced uh, weariness and growing tired. Jesus experienced anger, temptation, heartache, frustration, conflict, and confrontation. Jesus experienced all these things. The one thing that Jesus has never experienced is defeat. Jesus has never been defeated, and he does not currently experience defeat. If we are truly in him, if we truly find ourselves completely clothed with Jesus, as Scripture calls us to, then what does that say about us? So if Jesus has never experienced defeat, and we are in Jesus, what does that say about us? Just because we can't see the victory doesn't mean that we can't live the victory. It doesn't mean that it isn't there. So we march on, just like the Israelites, knowing that the battle is already won, and that all we have to do is to make the journey to the victory. And just like the Israelites, sometimes that means that in order to experience victory in this life, We need to learn to worship God even before we've seen it uh, and trust that he will do what he has said he will do. So three things. You want to know who your enemies are and know who your enemies are not. Know who the enemies of God's kingdom are. Other people are not your enemy. They are the ones that we have been left on this earth to help rescue. We have been left on this earth for a reason, to help rescue others, not to fight against them. Number two, we achieve victory not by strength of arms, but by the life and the work of Jesus, by finding ourselves in Jesus and by planting the truth of God's word in the forefront of our thoughts. And number three, we live victoriously by putting on the life of Jesus as our own and finding everything we are in him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that, that, um, that in every conflict and in every crisis that, uh, that we go through, Lord, sometimes the ones that you even lead us to, Lord, we thank you that you've already won victory, that Jesus has already accomplished everything. Um, Uh, Father, I pray that we would not be defeated by the lies of the enemy. I pray that we would not be defeated by discouragement or by deception or by any of the things that that come across our path. Father, I pray that we would find ourselves in the victory that Jesus has already won. Uh, Lord, thank you that you don't call us to fight battles that we can't fight on our own. Um, Lord, thank you that you go with us. We offer you in all these things in Christ's name. Let's stand and uh, sing together just one verse of God of grace and God of glory. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown thine ancient churches, story, bring her. If you would like to join us in the fellowship hall, there'll be a wonderful taco bar to benefit uh, Madeline Flores and her ministry in the Dominican. Receive now the uh, benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.